Hello everybody and welcome to our next episode of Sanctuary, our tour of the churches, the homes that we have built for our blessed Lord. Today we are in New Braunfels at Saints Peter and Paul. This church was founded in 1845 by German immigrants. Tradition tells us that this oak tree, which is marked by this placard that is here in front of it next to me, was the location that the German settlers, as they came in on a Good Friday, celebrated their first mass. There is no definite evidence of it, but it's a beautiful tradition, none to, none to say. And so we are also going to be joined here by one of the parishioners, a historian. She is learning her trade from a distant fa from an uncle family member who is a priest historian friend. And so at this time, I want to invite Miss Carolyn up with us today. Good morning. I'm Carolyn Phelan, and I am so excited to be here this morning with you guys. I was born and raised in New Braunfels. And uh, my husband is military, and he was also from New Braunfels, and so we were gone for a while, but then we knew we always wanted to retire back here. Yeah. So we've been back for the last 13 years. But um, this is my home parish. My family's here. My ancestors are from here. And so we're pretty excited to show it off. Well, I'm glad. What would you say is one of your favorite aspects or things about the church? Maybe just the warm, welcoming community, and then the fact that and I'll touch on this later, is how the church has grown right there on that same footprint. It's kind of fun and exciting to see how we started out as a really small little crude hut of wood, and then we've grown to this wonderful, beautiful church that we all awesome. worship in. Now, we talked a little bit in my introduction. This is a German community. So tell me a little bit about maybe that German heritage and how it's impacted this parish and maybe your family as you've been a part of it for so long. All right, great. Yes, this is a parish built in New Braunfels, and New Braunfels was settled by a prince from Germany back in 1845. Prince Karl of Psalms Braunfels um, was appointed the, the man who was going to lead the expedition over here. I guess it wasn't an expedition. It was settle, settlement. They were going to settle New Braunfels. And so he was told by the Edelsverein, the men in Germany, that when you arrive in Texas, you were to found two churches on that very first day, a Protestant church and a Catholic church. And he had no trouble finding a minister for the Protestant congregation, which is just down the street right behind us, right in front of us. And, um, but he had a bigger time finding a Catholic priest. At that time, there just weren't that many priests in this part of the world. In fact, it's said that there were no more than 12 priests in all of the Republic of Texas. We were a republic still at that point, not yet a state. Mm -hmm. And so Prince Carl sailed over in 1845, and he started out up in um, Boston, and then he looked for priests there. Then he went on down to New York, still not finding a priest force, went on down to Baltimore, still came up with nothing. Then he apparently took a steamer and went down some of the rivers and came all the way down to New Orleans, still looking for priests. And again, he came up short. So then he went on to Galveston, which is where all of the German settlers were going to meet him. And then they were gonna come on over here. And so while he was in Galveston, he met up with Bishop Jean-Marie Odin. And Bishop Odin was kind of over Galveston at that time. I don't believe it was yet a diocese yet, but um, Bishop Odin took care of Texas, essentially. And so Bishop Odin took a liking to the prince and said, I will find you a priest. And so Prince Carl went ahead and came on up here to New Braunfels and then awaited the first settlers. And the first settlers, um, they all met there in Galveston, Indianola, and then they came up, walked up the, the path from there to here and arrived right here on March 21st, 1845, which was Good Friday that year. And um, again, they still did not have their Catholic priest, but the Catholic community was formed and founded that very first day when they arrived here. Now, uh, we've learned from Prince Carl's diary that was recently translated from German into English about all of his different dealings with the bishop. And he and the bishop would do things like go to San Antonio together and they went to mass at San Fernando and it's all written in Prince Carl's book and they went to the missions. I mean, this is all back in 1845. So that's yeah. kind of cool. So they, um, there's a lot written about what he and the, and the bishop did together. Well, then there's one entry that says on May 1st, 1845, the priest couldn't make it. There was no mass. So apparently there was supposed to be a circuit rider priest, one of these saddlebag priests that came up you probably were expecting from Castorville and went and did a circle Castorville New Braunfels Fredericksburg and did that mm -hmm. kind of loop there were also priests who came up out of Frelsburg that came to New Braunfels but typically our circuit riders seem to come out of Castorville so we were expecting one to come on May 1st 1845 which would have been Ascension Thursday 
and apparently we had had rain because in Prince Carl's diary it states that because of the rain the priest couldn't make it. So then on May 4th, which would have been the Sunday after Ascension Thursday that year in 1845, apparently the priest made it. And in Prince Carl's diary it says something like, Indians present, or priest arrived, Indians present, Catholic priest left for Austin, services held. And so we have documentation there that their first mass was actually here in New Braunfels on May 4th, 1845. And so that would have been 175 years ago. Right, and cool. this earlier this spring, we were planning to have a very large celebration honoring that. Mm -hmm. And then we had the coronavirus hit. Yes. And so we're putting that off till next year. And but it, but we've been here 175 years. Awesome. And so that's kind of how we got here. Yeah. Well, and the story is very similar to instance for Panna Maria, which we filmed our very first episode in. You may remember we talked about that the Polish settlers also arrived in Galveston. They landed in Galveston. They walked all the way to San Antonio and then came down south where they settled, where the San Antonio River and the Cibolo Creek met. And very similar stories. And you had one of those Polish priests. And I think if you actually remember the story of Father Leopold, it actually says that he was brought into Texas to, ser to serve the German communities as well. So you may even have some connection to Father Muchigamba as well. He was here. There I'll you go. I'll show you all the priests that we've had, all of our pastors on a yeah. wall in the hall. And he was one of our pastors. So that's a very interesting connection that we have. That, and yet to remember, so this is about 10 years before Panna Maria was founded. He had come, was serving the German communities. And in the time serving, for instance, here at St. Peter and Paul and in the area, is when he was writing letters to Poland to his family telling them, you need to come to Texas. There is land, there is availability. Ironically, if you remember the story, he is run out of Panna Maria once they found it because the settlers arrived, there is no housing, there is no food, it's the middle of a drought. Go figure, it's a drought in Texas. It happens every couple years, it seems like. But he was run out of Panna Maria. And then later on, after his death, reinterred back right next door to the church. So a very interesting connection between the church here and the church in Panna Maria. Well, I'm looking forward to this tour. So at this time, let's journey on into the church where we'll turn Miss Carolyn loose to do her tour of this beautiful church here in New Braunfels. I want to start the tour with these holy water fonts. We just recently reinstalled these beautiful holy water fonts. These were in the church from about 1900 until 1963 when we had a renovation. And for some reason, they plucked them out in 1963, along with a bunch of our statues and baptismal fonts and things, and they sold them in a tent sale in the parking lot. And so apparently some of the people who bought them, and we have some of the statues that were recovered, uh, re redone, and they're in the parish office area. But um, my uncle was able to reacquire some of these things through some of the people he knew, and he got, was able to get back the holy water fonts. And the lady who had bought them said, you may have them as long as they get put back into church into their original use. And um, our current pastor was more than happy to do that. So we took them, and there's two of them. And uh, the ones we had here before since our 2000 renovation were these little things that no one could really find. And so now we have these. We haven't used them yet because of the corona, but uh, one of our other parishioners made these beautiful inserts that have a beautiful little embossed in there. It's kind of pretty so that we can clean them more easily. But these are the marble um, holy water fonts that have been missing and are back now. Our stained glass windows were installed in 1903, and um, they're all very beautiful. And we have some that were installed in the front part of the church. When we did our renovation in the year 2000, we needed to add a few more. And so we went to the source and got some that look pretty much the same, so they kind of all match in style. Here we have the Stations of the Cross. Our Stations of the Cross are made from pressed paper and they were imported from Holland in 1908. St. Peter and Paul has been here since 1845, and at the beginning we were actually called St. Peter, Prince of the Apostles Catholic Church until our renovation in 1871. But at the very beginning in 1845, there were 240 families, first founders, that came to New Braunfels with Prince Carl that arrived between March 21st and the end of July of that year, and those are considered first founders. Of those first founder families, 240 of them, 
31 were actually Catholics. So we started out with a Catholic community of about 31 families. Today, we have over 5,300 families, and we're currently a very, very active church. We have six uh, weekend liturgies. We have a Saturday evening at 5, and then we have five different masses on Sunday, four in the morning and one in the evening. And one of those is in Spanish as well. And um, so this is our, our beautiful church. So Saints Peter and Paul originally started, even prior to that little small orange rectangle, as a crude hut of wood. So back in 1845, we arrived, we started having masses said by those uh, saddlebag priests in various parishioners' homes. And then Archbishop uh, Odin said, hey, I will work to get you guys your town, your lots for your church. Back when the Germans left Germany, they were promised town lots for their churches. And so um, Bishop Odin came in 1846 and asked the city of New Braunfels at that time if we could have our lots. And so we were given four town lots, which is where we still sit. At that time, Bishop Odin said, you may certainly start building a house of worship. And so the settlers at that time built something really small and they called it the crude hut of wood. Well, Bishop Odin came to say mass and he really wasn't very pleased. He said it wasn't quite large enough or big enough or grand enough. And so he asked them to, to build something a little bit bigger and more worthy of worship to our God. And so at that time, they started building the original Walnut Church in 1849. It was dedicated in September of 1849, and it measured 25 by 35 feet. And we received our first pastor, first full-time pastor, in December of 1849, Father Gottfried Menzel from Bohemia. Right here is where we started with the original hut uh, or the original walnut church in 1849 and it measured 25 by 35 feet and here inside of our church we can point to some light fixtures and that draws out that rectangle where the church was then in 1874 we recognized that we needed more space and so they laid the cornerstone for the first stone church which is this part in green and it was completed in 1874. When it was completed, they had left this Walnut Church here in the middle so that they could continue to have their worship services. When they were finished building this stone church, they took this wooden one down piece by piece and carried it out the front doors of the new stone church and sold it, sold the lumber in the parking lot of the, of the church at that time. Then around 18... 98 to the year 1905, there was a large renovation um, of the interior. It was more cosmetic than anything, but we kept the same footprint of the green stone church. Then in 1963, we recognized that we needed even more space, and so we just bumped out this area here where the altar is and scooted it back and then added on this yellow portion. And then um, there was a cry room here and the sacristy was over here. Then in the year 2000, we had so many people that we bumped it out on this side, created a large wing there, and bumped this out behind the altar. And, and now you have the church that grew, the little room that grew of 1849. At one time, we were one of the painted churches from about 1905 till right at the 1963 renovation and we had beautiful painting inside of our church, just like the painted churches. And this is all that remains, and this is inside the bell tower. Uh, we're standing at the foot of the base of the bell tower, and this was one of the original arches inside the building. At every one of our episodes, I've tried to highlight the altar stone and the relic that is found in each altar. As y'all may remember, and it's probably getting a little repetitive maybe for y'all, the idea of the relic is that it connects us to the communion of saints. The saint here at St. Peter and Paul is actually a very little known saint. His name was St. Jacundus. He is from the 3rd or 4th century. There's actually a couple of St. Jacunduses in the history of the church. Uh, but there is very little known about them. And so there is very little public veneration as well. Uh, if it is the saint that we think it is, he was actually killed in the 5th century as a martyr. So he was a martyr that would be in the altar stone here at St. Peter and Paul. Even though it is a saint that very little know about, it is still good for us to learn of these saints. I am very fond of comparing the history of the saints. We so often 
kind of lock in on the same 50, 75 saints in our modern church. Now what happens is the rest of the saints kind of reminds me of those old cemeteries that we go to where some of the graves are a little bit neglected. They're growing over, the tombstones are falling over just because no one remembers them. No one knows who they are anymore. That I think the same way of some of our, late, our early saints like Jucundus, that no one really knows anything about them. So there isn't a feast day celeb or a mass usually celebrated on their feast day. Just for an FYI, if this is the Jucundus we think it is, his feast day is December 30th. And so it is something, just something to keep in mind that there is so many saints in the history of our church. I encourage you, go out, learn about them. Discover a new one. You know, with some of our parishes, we have an adopt a senior program where we go out and we spend time taking care of the elderly. I want to challenge you, adopt a saint. Go out, discover a saint you've never heard of before. Share his story. Maybe start a little bit of devotion to him asking his intercession. You might be surprised at the results of that building of that relationship. This is our grotto. It was built in 1921. There was the flu, Spanish flu epidemic from 1918 to 1919. And our parish suffered 45 deaths of our parishioners. And at the time, our pastor was Father Vock, W-A-C-K, but we pronounce it Vock. And he led the parishioners in making a solemn vow to Our Lady that if she would intercede on their behalf and the deaths of our parishioners would be halted, that he would build a grotto as a um, thank you and he would make it look like the grotto in Lourdes, France, which is where he was from. And so, miraculously, the deaths did in fact quit. And so then in 1920, Father Vach went over to France to get the dimensions and all the details on how to build the grotto. He came back and then the parishioners enlisted the help of a man from Nebraska who was a stonemason to help them build the grotto. And the honeycomb rock that is around the, the outside of it was gathered from different ranches here in the vicinity of parishioners. And then there's some flint that's used along the back and the flint was picked up here in the direct area around the parish. And so the parishioners were able to dedicate the grotto on June 29th, 1921. And that was the same day that Father Vach received his investiture. Uh, the bishop came out and uh, it was a big day of celebration. Hello, everybody. I want to hope that you're having as much fun with this sanctuary series, enjoying watching the episodes as much as I have been enjoying making them. I want to invite you, if you're interested in keeping up with all of the updates and everything new going on with our sanctuary series, go into YouTube, find the Today's Catholic YouTube, uh, Newspapers YouTube page, subscribe to the page, and then click for notifications. Doing that will allow you to be notified whenever we post a new episode. We would love for you to do so to allow you to be able to keep abreast of everything that we have going on with our series on Sanctuary. Okay, so in 1871, we built our first stone church, and that was the one that was built over that um, Black Walnut Church. Then when we expanded in 1963, we were looking around for some more stone blocks that would match in color and type. Well, that was about the time that uh, we were able to acquire some blocks that had been used at the county jail. And so we got those and they matched. And the interesting thing about those stones that were used when we expanded the church is some of them have parishioners, not parishioners, prisoners initials in, uh, engraved in them. Up there we can see one that looks like an H. There's next to it kind of a JJ. Over to this other side we see one that they uh, chiseled an A. Someplace there's a a few other letters as well. Out here in our grotto area, we also have this large stainless steel rosary and our Circle of Mary meets here to pray the rosary every Thursday. Inside the center of the rosary is a unique symbol and it was made by one of our parishioners, Tilly Gold, and it was created of small stones carried by parishioners on the dedication of our expanded renovated church in the year 2000. This was all put out here in this area right after that renovation in 2000. This is a photograph that was taken on November 4th, 1945 
St. Peter and Paul celebrated its 100th anniversary and they had a mass in the parking lot and uh, they were able to have a panoramic photograph taken that day. And again, you can see the uh, oak tree starting to get tall. And in the very side over here, you can see the rectory, which was built in 1895. And still stands today. This is our rectory. It was constructed in 1895 and has been in continual use until just at a year ago when the priest moved out so that we could begin our renovation project and we're getting ready to get that started but it's it's served us well since 1895. Uh, the rectory renovation is being made possible by um, contributions to the capital campaign. This is one of our projects that we stated in our church case and it um, will be funded through those donations. This is our school. Uh, this is the side of the gym with the mural on it. The Saints Peter and Paul School will be celebrating its 150th anniversary in the fall of 2021. It was founded in uh, the fall of 1871 and so has served the Catholic community for a good quality education for 150 years. Originally, our first pastor was Father Menzel and he in 1849-1850 uh, when he first got here uh, started a school and then Father Mustigamba after him kind of continued that school and they served some children at that time. Uh, the schools didn't last and so then the Sisters of Divine Providence when they came when they were founded then they came in in 1871 and started our school and it has been um, non-stop since then. Nuns were the teachers for many years and um, then at some point we switched to all lay people being our teachers in the school. And today we have approximately 350 to 370 students in grades pre-K through eight. photos of the interior of the church around 1908. There was that renovation that was completed around 1905, which was just cosmetic, and that was when we became a painted church and got that new pulpit. And then here in, in this middle one, you can see more of that painting. And then this one was done 1921 uh, when we dedicated the grotto and Father Vox investiture. And that really shows a lot of the painting at that point. And these other pictures uh, that's a picture of Mary's altar from our church in 1946. We had some beautiful woodwork at that time. And there, another picture of the main altar in 1946 with the um, painted walls. And then there's St. Joseph's altar again in 1946. Saints Peter and Paul keeps alive our German heritage Every year in November during Wurstfest, the first weekend we invite the Village Brass Band to come and join us. They provide the music for all of our hymns. Some of them we sing in German. The following weekend, we invite a local German choir to come and provide all of the music. 
both weekends, many of our parishioners will show up wearing lederhosen and dirndl dresses. This is our statue of Mary holding baby Jesus. And below the statue is a candelabra shaped like an M, and it's our devotion to Our Lady of Fatima. And we light these candles every 13th of every month, and they burn throughout the day. This statue is one of the ones that has been in our church since about 1900. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. The angel of the Lord declared unto Mary, and she conceived of the Holy Spirit. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Behold the handmaid of the Lord. Be it done unto me according to thy word. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Pray for us, O Holy Mother of God, that we may be made worthy of the promises of Christ. Let us pray. Pour forth, we beseech thee, O Lord, thy grace into our hearts, that we to whom the incarnation of Christ thy Son was made known by the message of an angel, may by his passion and cross be brought to the glory of his resurrection, through the same Christ, our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 